Welcome to More Than A Few Words, a marketing conversation for business owners. This is Lorraine Ball. Are you curious about what I'm going to say next? <laughs> I hope you are, because curiosity is a great starting point for content, conversations, videos, podcasts, you name it. And to have this conversation about content, okay, that's a mouthful. You try saying that several times fast. I've invited Emily Aborn to join me. She is a copywriter, speaker, and podcast host. She's been an entrepreneur for more than a decade, running brick and mortar and online businesses. She's collaborated with thousands of individuals in over a hundred industries as a copywriter. And she brings her personality, creativity, and message to life as she guides them to build community and relationship-based businesses. She enjoys word games, listening to podcasts, hiking with her husband, Jason, and their dog, Clyde, who we had a conversation about. Emily, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Lorraine. I'm really excited to be here. I am too. And I loved when we were talking about this show that you suggested the topic of curiosity marketing. I want to start with your definition of what is curiosity marketing? Okay, that is a fun place to start. And didn't it make you curious to hear what curiosity marketing was? It so, absolutely did. Kind of, kind of meta. Yes. <laughs> so my definition of curiosity marketing is basically f uh, creating a gap between what the person on the other side knows and what you know, so and what they don't know, basically. So what you know, but they don't know. So it's creating that gap between those two things. And that gap is kind of what keeps them pulled along, inviting them to keep on going and learning and knowing more. So we want to make the gap there, present, but not so spicy and curiosity invoking that they're confused and they have no idea what we're talking about. So there's a difference between curiosity and confusion, right? Absolutely. And I love that you, you kind of started with talking about the size of that gap, because I do think that that is a tightrope that marketers have to walk mm. to find that place between making people feel curious, but not uncomfortable. Yes, 100%. You said it perfectly. So how, how do I do that? How do I know when I'm pushing the boundaries too far? What's a good guideline for me to make people curious, but not uncomfortable? I think one place to start, which you and I started with in our conversation before we before we hit record, is to know who we're talking to. So we have to kind of start with saying, all right, who am I talking to? Because then you know where they're start, you know better where they're starting from, right? So like mm -hmm. understanding where they're even coming from helps you to know what they know, what they maybe don't know, what they're struggling with, those kind of things. I heard this um, fascinating concept from a fellow writer, Mignon Fogarty. She is the host of the Grammar Girl podcast. I'm obsessed with her podcast. Like, love it. Uh, she said every year she goes through her own content and she asks herself, would I follow me? Like, would I be interested in what I do? Because a lot of us, tr truth be told, a lot of us are speaking to a former version of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I just think it's a really powerful place to kind of start. Like, do a little self-audit. Am I, would I follow me? Would I be interested in what I'm saying? Am I delivering value to somebody like me? So I think those are two really, really good places to start. And we can go into more specifics, but I just want to start there. Well, I... I'm glad that you started with that comment of would I follow me because that process can really be an eye opener. I go back and read my old newsletters or listen to my old podcast. I'm doing this a long time. On the one hand, sometimes it makes me cringe because that's not who I am anymore. And on the other hand, sometimes I read something or listen to something and go, that was really good. I, I should talk to people like that more so that that reflection, I think, is great. But let's dive into that a little bit more. Are there different types of curiosity? And as you're creating content, do you need to keep those different types in mind? 
Well, there actually are four different types of curiosity. I did not come up with this. Uh, this is not an original thought. You can find it anywhere you you search things on the internet. But uh, basically, so there's one type of curious, which is called the fascinated. And I sort of, Lorraine, from your podcast, I sort of get the, the feeling that probably this is you. But you have like a wide range of what makes you curious. And you like just like kind of a variety of different topics. Like a lot of things capture your attention and grab your interest. Then you have the empathizer. That's a person who is very curious about other people, what makes them tick, what creates a connection, right? So you're kind of like really people centric in your curiosity. The third one is the problem solver. So this is, I have a little bit of this in me. If I am trying to find the solution to a problem or figure out how something works, I get super, super curious, right? Like I will fixate on that problem until I figured out how to solve it. And the last one, which I don't think they're probably listening to your episodes because they're not really taking in much new information or insight. It's the avoider. And this is just really the person like you're not going to really appeal to them very much with your marketing, kind of no matter what you do. They're more of a passive kind of person. So those are the four. And I do think it is important in our content that we have a concept of who we're talking to. So, but there are different ways, like you might find that you experiment with all of those types of curiosity and like what kind, A, what kind drives me and B, what kind tends to drive my clients. So my clients don't tend to be, well, I'm a big time empathizer. That's like my number one. My number two is problem solver. My clients Clients are more of the fascinated and the problem solver. And I know this about them. So I, I don't really, I, again, I don't really attract an avoider because they're not really listening to my stuff in the first place. So, or taking in my content. So I think you can keep those in mind and you can look at your own content and you can also look at who tends to be attracted to what you're sharing and then use that in your marketing. And I think it's really a powerful, like a powerful way to reach them. So I know when I think about my audience in general, and I think about my target market, and I, I say this a lot to clients, is you don't have to appeal to everybody. And as a matter of fact, when you you try to water the message down, you end up really not connecting with anyone. Would you say that's similar when you're kind of trying to connect with a person's curiosity style that you, like I, I hear you say, I gave, I, I don't really worry about the avoiders because that's not my market. Is that an appropriate strategy? Yes. And I think one to this point, one of the great ways to bring like more curiosity in, and this might seem counterintuitive, but actually being more specific. So using specific stories, using specific examples, using specific challenges and pain points, the more specific we are, let me pose a, a thought experiment to you. So if I say like, Lorraine, I want you to imagine that you are taking a bite out of a, out of an apple. Okay, great. So your brain went to maybe a Granny Smith, maybe a Yellow Delicious, Cortland, I don't know. But then if I say, Lorraine, I want you to imagine that you're biting into a just slightly too tart Granny Smith apple. Like I can feel in my cheeks them salivating, right? And they tighten up a little bit and you're like, Ooh, I know that. So using that specificity is actually a way to keep people interested, engaged, lean in and want to know more. Um, so don't shy away from being very specific, whether it be storytelling or examples. The, 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 there's a saying that says like the specific is the universal, you know? So when we use specific, it's actually, we think it's like, oh, well, I don't want to, I don't want to turn anyone away, but it's actually very, it speaks directly to them. You know, that I, I can definitely see that. And I think that's, and I don't want to go down the AI road too far, but I heard an interview where they gave both AI and a, a writer, a professional writer, the same prompt. And the biggest difference between the output that both created when you listen to them is the AI was fine, but it was very generic. Mm. It was sort of something that could have been about anybody. And the writer had gone down this really narrow niche with this really obscure kind of opening context, uh, uh, storyline and context. And it, it totally piqued my curiosity. It absolutely made me want to say, oh, I, I, I want to know how that story ends. 
it's what keeps you engaged in a great book, right? Like the more detail, the more specific it is, the more you're turning that page because you feel what the person you're reading about feels. And and then I want to bring like to that exact point of the AI being um, very generic. There's a way to do this where in your content specifically where you're not being so when you're being specific, you're not shutting anybody down. And that is not to close loops. So I love when I'm delivering content, I might show different ways that it applies to people, but I don't close a loop. So I never want to tell somebody what to think, tell somebody what to feel, tell somebody how this should be experienced for them. Mm -hmm. I want to keep loops open and let them draw their own conclusions, have their own feelings and their own thoughts. And that's another really great way that, I mean, you'll see it in professional writing all of the time, but they leave that loop nice and open for you. And then you're like, I got to turn the next page. I got to see the next post. I got to listen to the next episode. Absolutely. Absolutely. Emily, this is fabulous. Thank you so much for being a part of the show. Thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. It was. And if you are listening right now and you are curious, you definitely want to check out emilyaborn.com. Emily, E-M-I-L-Y, Aborn, A-B-O-R-N.com. There'll be links in the show notes. Thanks again. Thanks, Lorraine. And... If you're looking for other resources for your business, be sure to look for MTFW wherever you listen to podcasts. Listen to two. They're short. This has been another episode of More Than a Few Words. Thanks for listening.